to start actually recording this. Hello. <laughs> um, you know, move my head somewhere, but you will not be blocked by it. There we go. So now we can see what our intentions are for today. Is uh, we're going to be doing some level design, and then we're going to make it in Unity, which is pretty legit. I'm just going to set up my little area over here while we wait for people to come in. You made it! Oh my god! <laughs> How are you doing? How do I rename? There we go. This is the Photoshop recording section. And I want to copy this. And I want to paste this. You said you need it? Yeah, you can just open it with the personal license. And it will, uh, you can just do it for free because like, technically they want you to buy stuff and so they'll be like, oh, you need a license to use our stuff, man. You need to, uh, you absolutely can't just do your own thing. No, you can just tell them personal license and it'll work. And this is the Unity. Oh, that's annoying, okay. Unity. Oh, that's annoying. They all, they're all the same. Oh, I see. Okay, so I have to actually add a new display capture. Sorry, I'm just learning how to use Twitch again. Nope, I don't want a display capture. I want a window capture. Mm -hmm. There you are. Photoshop. There we go. Okay. There we go. That's better. <laughs> Alrighty. Um, so it's 535 and we have, how many people do we have in here? We have 21 viewers. So I'm going to assume that everybody's here <laughs> and we're going to, we're going to start the show. So welcome back. Uh, last time we were doing character animation and do, do, do. So let me just put Blender up for a second because I have that open. Uh, uh, uh. Boom, Blender. And so what we did is we had modeled our character, we had rigged our character, and we had made a little walk cycle with our character. Yeah. Perfect. And so now what our plan is, we're going to bring that character into Unity. And um, do, 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 do. and I, I have this project all set up and I can, I can create a zipped version of it that I'll send to you guys after this lecture. And you guys can start playing it all on your own and make your own little levels. Um, so in here, like this is, it's a pretty full product project like people have like been in here before so it's it's not as streamlined as a, a brand new project would be but basically to do the premise is and I've shown you guys this before is oh music take it <laughs> there we go turn that off <laughs> um, so yeah you walk around you walk around camera kind of follows the mouse, ah, these little guys that jump at you, and boo, 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 you can shoot. And so this particular level, I don't believe, has a goal, but this one did have a goal. There we go. This one I think was probably the strongest in terms of like actual level design. So the goal is up there. That is the goal. Ah, <laughs> that is the goal way over there. And what might have made it a bit better would be if people, or if you could actually see the goal. Ugh. I'm gonna like turn around. This is the world's worst camera. Um, if you could actually see the goal from the beginning. There, now you can see the goal. Duh. And what Ellen tried to do was actually give people the option of an easy way and a hard way to get to their goal. 
Uh, the enemies don't kill you, so that's, that's something. This one was actually like, a, quite a difficult level, especially for people who are not super keen on video games. Ta-da! And then you win and you go back to the, the, the start screen. But um, what I want to go through today is uh, how to design a level that gives the player like a sense of choice, a sense of like, you know, adventure, and is actually easily readable from the very beginning. So step one will be bringing character into the scene. And for like just for today, what you guys can do is you can go to like your scenes, right click here in like the hierarchy, create scene, and then just write in my name, scene. And I can go over that again once uh, we're later on. You double click that to open it. Oh, that was a mistake. I shouldn't have done that. Go away. No, go away. What I wanted to do was duplicate an existing scene. So you take robot scene, duplicate it, and then rename it to my scene. My name, scene. And your name is your name. And then you open that. There we go. That's what I wanted to do. Because that way it brings in the game with it. <laughs> Otherwise you should have an empty box. And so now you have a new scene and you have everything that you need for the game to actually work. So let's say we have, uh, so this is our character base. And inside there we have the character holder. And in there we have our little character, which is Klaatu, right? It was made a little while ago. Do, do, do. And all you have to do basically is bring your character into the meshes folder, you just basically open it up and like drag and drop, like, bloop, and it'll show up in here. And then you could be like, all right, uh, instead of uh, Claudio, I want Catman. And now we have Catman. And it appears that Catman is actually rotated in a funny way, so I just bloop, take it and rotate it properly. <laughs> and it's a little bit small, so you can make it a little bit bigger. There we go. And that pretty much brings in your character. It's not it's not animated yet, but we'll go over that later. Uh, your stream is lagging badly because apparently if you have downloaded the actual editor, it's taking up all the bandwidth right now. I'm missing some, some instructions. That's okay. Um, we'll go over this again at the end. I just kind of wanted to quickly talk about how to bring characters in um, in a really basic sense. Don't worry about uh, bring in the animations or how that works because that'll be in our last class, polish class. So this is just literally getting your character in here so you can test your own level. That's, that's all it really is. Okay, boom. Alrighty, so let's go into a land known as, no, that's not what I wanted. I want Photoshop. Photoshop. There we go. Okay, <laughs> so let me turn off Blender because that's eating up some of my power. Ooh. Save that, put that, nice. So in Photoshop, and I'm pretty sure you guys can see my, my cursor. What I want to do and what I always do before making a level is I will draw it out first. I don't like to start with actually building it because then you'll start doing stuff that's easy, but not necessarily good. You wanna start from like a very sketchy idea of what you want and then go in from there. So like for example, that uh, I, before the course started, I was talking about that crab game I made for The Last Ludum Dare, where you had to go around and collect all of the uh, different uh, objects and bring them to like the top of the spire. So we had like a spire and we had a little river that ran through the scene and we had land on this side, land on this side, and kind of a little hill where you start on, and then a little back hill. And so you had to bring all the all the objects here, and some of them were hidden. So like some of them were hidden in here, one of them was over here, one of them was behind some rocks over here, one of them was over here. Um, one of them actually started behind the player, which was here, and uh, the last one was there, let's say. So those would be, those were the objects in the level, and they all had to bring them here. And it was very interesting because people 
always tended to go in the same general path through the level every time. Because what, what I like to do, I like to stream uh, Ludum Dare, like playing the other games. And I also like to watch other people stream my game, which is super fun. And so you can get like a really hands-on look at what, what their thought process is as, you're, as they're playing and, and basically what how they react to your game. So let's say the person starts here, right? They never went this way. They never went that way, not even once. They always walked this way around the spire. Then they climbed the spire and they looked that way, right? This was pretty much every single time. Like every single time they played the game, they did this, which was annoying because A, they never looked at this because I guess it looked too much. This object over here was a big plank of wood and I guess it looked like it was just part of the background. So they never, they never found that one. This one over here, they did find every single time because they were looking straight at it. <laughs> And so they would take it and they would pull it up to the top and it would stick. And they were like, okay, they have got the first object. The game would tell them they got the first object. Cool. And then they'd be looking out and they'd see the river and they would, oh, there's another one over here. And then this was interesting because it depended on how far they jumped. Either they would not jump very far and they would find the one in the river because they would land in the river or they would see this over here and they would get that. So these were almost mutually exclusive. They would never get both. <laughs> they would never get both. And then they would bring it back up and then they would probably go and this one they seemed to get pretty well. And this one was always the last one they got. No, no, second last. The last one was this bad boy over here. Nobody ever found this one, nobody. Because every time they started going around the level, they got into a loop where they would just hug the walls. And that's how they found this guy is because they were hugging the walls. But they would start doing this loop, like where is everything I am lost? And they never, for whatever reason, I guess because the land was higher over here, they never looked into this little cave. And so the biggest failures were this one and this one because they were actually behind the player's orientation. It's like, um, I don't know if anybody's ever like studied how comics are made, but or even film is the exact same way. So these are two, two shots in film, right? In the first one, you know, you have your character and they're talking to another character, right? And let's say this is an overhead view over here of two people standing and talking to each other, right? This is a room. And the camera in the first part, in the first panel, is right here. And it's, it's looking like this. There's actually an imaginary line in film that goes straight through the scene. And you can set up where you want it, but you can never ever cross it. And it's got a, it's got a very specific name. Yeah. Is that like the line of orientation or something like that? But basically, it's, uh, it's 180 degrees in which you can rotate or like um, kind of like orbit your camera around. So if this is the line here, you can never, you can go over here, you can go over there, you can go over here, but you can never go over here, right? And then you have to follow that, otherwise people get lost in your scenes. And what actually was done in The Shining by like Stephen, or Stanley Kubrick, sorry, was he would actually regularly cross that line just to disorient and like put the viewer on edge because they won't understand why it's disorienting. It just is, it's just, it's, it's outside of human experience. So you can be like, it's over here or it's over here or it's over here, but you have to pick 180 degrees and that's, that's filmography. So you could be like, uh, you could be like in the next scene is then them, you know, talking face to face like this. And that works. You can still tell that this person is like person A and this person is person B, right? But if you were to completely reverse it, and let's say the camera is now over here, now, according to the camera, person A is over, or B is over here, 
and person A is over here, the, play, the, the, the viewer would be like, what the, like, wait, like, they were just on the other side. <laughs> they were just on the other side. And so that, that was what I actually failed at over here in this game was that I did not pay attention to what the orientation of the player was going to be. Their orientation line was right here. And I, and I should have been clued into that because the opening scene of the game, let me pull it up one second. Where's my crap game? Blue and Dari. And Dari 25. Crap game. And everybody has any questions, just let me know in the uh, in the chat. Uh, where's the key shot? And where's the title screen? There we go. Okay, so they're opening. <laughs> so this was the before I even started work on the game. This was a a drawing that I basically photo bashed together from internet things uh, to tell me what the game should like look like. And as you can see, you know, we can in and. Oh, it's a GIF. That's why it took so long. This is the this is the starting screen of the game. This is the first thing the player sees. Is they're looking. This is the ridge. That first object I mentioned is right behind the camera, and they're looking out into this cavern with a little river behind it. It's got this spire where you're supposed to take all the objects, and your your goal is to is pile the objects up here and escape the tide pool. And so, without even intending to do it, I created a line here where the camera or of the player's imagination would not cross. It was really hard for them to kind of reverse this, which is why they had a lot of trouble with these objects over here. They had some trouble over here sometimes, but for whatever reason, everything on the, the sort of camera facing side of the spire, and you can have the camera facing any direction in this game, like it, was, it would just follow the crab, right? Uh, but for some reason, they just could not wrap their heads around these two objects. So that was that was very interesting. So um, I want I just wanted to bring that up before we start, just because it was a valuable learning experience for me, and I thought maybe you guys would enjoy it. Um, uh, one thing I think it did actually, for the most part, uh, succeed in is the shape language was quite strong. Um, people were immediately able to determine what was um, part of the environment for the most part and what was grabbable. So for example, a screwdriver or a water bottle or a, what was another good one? I'm trying to think of what it was and it was October when I made these. Um, a cup. These ones were very easy for people to distinguish. So these ones had very good uh, shape language that they were something that could be grabbed. Uh, the ones that were the weakest were, it was, it was a plank of wood. Um, another one was a stick with some tape on it. And I want to say a sandal, yes. So a flip flop. So for some reason, these ones were a lot easier for people to distinguish as um, objects that are useful than these ones. And in hindsight, it makes perfect sense because uh, these objects, I guess, I guess, I guess the shape language ties into it. Like people were able, people were aware that these were not part of the environment, but I think what it was really hitting on was was affordance, and what affordance is is when you as a human being enter a game and you have certain preconceptions about what is useful. So for example, you're playing a game and you see a ladder, right? So this, this is an affordance. Uh, you know that this is going to be something useful. You can climb it, right? Um, like for example, I saw a talk on YouTube about it was the latest uh, Shadow of the Tomb Raider game. And what they were doing is there would be a bridge and the bridge was out, right? And you know, uh, what's her face? Laura Croft would be standing, there she is, 
on one end of the bridge and they wanted the player to use their crossbow to create a grappling line across the bridge. And they had just received this crossbow or maybe they'd had it for a while, but some players simply would forget about it, right? Or they would see it, they'd be like, oh, the bridge is out, I need to go another way. But what they really wanted them to do was cross the bridge. So what they did is they created this like little kind of like ropes blowing in the wind over here that were like a different color from the background and they and they would uh they would flap so they would like you would draw the attention there so the player knew that this was something important and they're like oh okay so i am supposed to go that way oh i have a crossbow right 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 and so they did this all over the place so they're like when there was a somewhere that you know they have like a, a rocky cliff and they would have little handholds that were a different color from the rest of the um of the land so they'd be like okay um this is clearly and you'd be able to see a very clear path up the mountain right so they they really tried to make it very clear when something was useful and it wasn't always as obvious as like uh a screwdriver is a useful thing a cup is a useful thing a water bottle is a useful thing whereas maybe a flip-flop is less useful they they had basically created their own language of affordance within the game because they, they didn't want to just be like, uh, here is a, they would make like some sort of, like the Legend of Zelda approach where it's like you have literally a target for the grappling hook, right? <laughs> and so Link would be there and he'd be like, hmm, let's go to some little like N64 nose. Hmm, what should I do here? Like, it's obvious, right? They wanted to be a little bit more realistic than that, so they they made their own little their little shape language and their own affordance. Um, so that is steps. So shape, I will get back to affordance. I think I've just discussed, so I'll just mark that one off. Um, another thing I wanted to discuss is sorry, I'm doing like a weird ringing in my headphones. Huh. Oh well. Um, so choice was another another good one I wanted to discuss. So in the crab game, there wasn't really much of a difference. Like you could you could get this thing and then this thing and then this thing and this thing and this thing and whatever in any order you wanted, and it didn't really affect the outcome of the game. But players did seem is he tabbing? <laughs> oh hey, welcome welcome. Yeah, link just dab and link. Do, 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 do. Ponytail. I don't know why I feel like he has a ponytail. He's got like a sick collar though. There we go. Now he's dabbing. There we go. <laughs> Some good lonk. There we go. Um, yeah, so <laughs> uh, the player didn't, didn't really matter what order they collected things in, but because they were in charge lonk, because they were in charge of their own journey through the game, they actually did feel like they had a choice. Like there, it wasn't literally like a like a straight room with like the spire at the end, with like the objects. Like up, like, oh, collected it, collected it, collected it. Collect there, there we go. We win! Yay! Woo. And I'm sure stonk honk. <laughs> Chat's going crazy. <laughs> Um, but yeah, so like, I'm sure you guys have all played a game that feels like this, where it's like, you have a straight path, and you collect object A, and then you collect object B, and you collect object C, and then you unlock the gate. I'm looking at you, Darksiders, too. Um, that was a very frustrating experience, because it was like, you're there, and you're really badass, and you've got your cool, I don't know, did it, was it a scythe? Was it a scythe axe? I can't, I can't actually remember what he a stonk oh i always thought a stonk was like you know when you put money into the the market and you make money uh a stonk market anyways so he was like okay so you have this door and it's clearly where you have to go next and the door needs three small keys because you know that's how you make a door is with three keys for sure um 
And so you have to go around this level and there's, you know, like a little area, a little area, a little area. You're like, cool. And now you go through the door. And then every single area after that has had, it has three keys. And then you go through the door. And then, but it wasn't like you could do them in any order. It was almost like this is the path through the level every single time. It wasn't open world. It was just literally uh, live ready player one. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I don't know if you guys read the book, but uh, the book actually, I feel, felt a lot more fun as a game almost than the movie did. The movie kind of felt pretty on rails, I thought. But uh, the riddles were a lot better in the book. I recommend it. It was good. Um, but yeah, so you got your three keys and you go through the thing and you get the thing. But it wasn't it wasn't open world like Ready Player One was, where it's like you have everything at your fingertips, and you just need to figure it out. It's like a game that does this, I think, superbly. I'm gonna pull it up. I just played it the other week. Dun, dun, dun. I've been repping this game to literally everyone I meet since it came out. For me, at least. One second. I'm gonna put it up here. Boom. Outer Wilds. This game is off the charts good. It's literally... And I'm gonna spoil as little as physically possible about this game, okay? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so what you want is Breath of the Wild open world choice. So Breath of the Wild was a perfect example of that. And I'll come back to that as an example of good level design. And there's GDC talks about it and you can, you can look it up. And you can see the guys who made the game discuss it. Yeah. I hope you guys played it. <laughs> So, so this game, Outer Wilds, you start on your planet, there's the sun, and then there's other planets that you can go to, right? And they're all just going around, do -do -do, doing their thing. And every time you go to a planet, you'll probably find something new, like, and there's there's like ancient writing and there's you know mysterious ruins you can explore and you can like basically there's, there's something new every time you visit um, and let's say I go over here first this is my first choice I think this planet this big gas giant over here looks the coolest I fly straight there right and then I go around there and I, you know, there's another traveler over here and I talk to him and he says, go to this island over here. And then I go to this island over here and then I, you know, find some stuff. And then, you know, and then I die. I'm like, okay, start back here. So now I know this. I'm like, all right, okay. So my clue from here directs me to this planet over here. So now I'm gonna go over there and that's number two. And over here, I find some more clues, and then that leads me to this little twin, and more clues, and then I die, and I start again. And then that leads me over here, but I don't have enough, like, knowledge to get through. Oh, there, I see, see, the planets, rock and hard place, they're going to collide. <laughs> well, if you play the game, you'll know. Uh, but, oh, these guys. Yeah, that's, that's a... That's a sh that's a not a good orbit. I'll call this a comet. There we go. <laughs> um, but yeah, so every time, like, it doesn't matter which order you go through, and you visit things over and over and over and over again, and every time it's in the context of new knowledge, so you are always like it's never the same place twice. <laughs> but oh, um, but yeah, so so that that was. A magnificent level design because ah uh, sorry I was scared of the whole thing. <laughs> Boink. Um, it was magnificent because it was one level that changed almost according to your understanding of it. It's like what you might see the first time is like this at surface level is just a planet, but once you're aware of like sort of the maps within and you're aware of the history of the planet and you know what like certain things on the surface do and how they affect other planets and so it's like it's one big ah <laughs> level design that all works together uh, breath of the wild is the same way where uh the guy who designed it this is from a talk of his so for those who've played there's basically four main areas 
and the end of the game is in the middle, right? Let's say I've done it again. I'm in the wrong layer, as usual. And the player starts off kind of right here. And they look around, and each area has its own landmarks. So this one's like a volcano. And this one is, you know, like waterfalls. There's a cool forest over here. Uh, this is a desert. This is a big castle in the middle. And so the player is kind of like, okay, which planet is the planet killer weapon? Well, that, that would be this one. So that one over there. To answer your question. <laughs> um, oh, how long did it take to beat? Um, I gave it 15 hours, probably. It's not, it's not too long. I would highly recommend if you have 15 hours. Um, or even if you don't, just, just do it. Test star? Maybe. Uh, but yeah, so there's these big major landmarks, but in between them, there's actually these little, you know, shrines, towers for navigation. And the way it was designed was that you could always see, no matter where you were, at least one other tower or shrine. No, no, sorry, it was three other towers or shrines from any given spot on the map. So no matter where Star Killer Base, <gasps> um, yeah, no matter where you were, you could see at least three other things. So if there was like maybe a hill here, you'd still be able to see these. And maybe you couldn't see over this way, but you could still see these. And this one, you could see this and this and this. So no matter where you are on the map, the player always had choice. And that, and that I think is what makes Breath of the Wild such an engaging play, is that everybody takes their own way through it. And it always feels unique every time you do it, um, even though it's all just the same map for everybody. It gives, it gives people sort of their, you know, uh, the feeling at least that they're doing something unique. They're going on a unique adventure. Um, so the last one uh, that I want to talk about before testing is shape. So uh, in the first class, we talked about, you know, good shapes. And um, I, I pulled up a YouTube video in, a, in Discord that kind of goes over this and how these shapes come into play in uh, the environment as well as character design. So, like, you know, these are safe. These are useful. These are dangerous. And um, so, like, let's say you have speedrun any percent. Breath of Wild is 10 minutes and 28 seconds. And see, that that's, that's because they know what they're doing. Like, the you can at any point beat the game in 10 minutes and 28 seconds. So can it be that long of a game? Well, it's like... The, the speed of... It's not like one... And it's not one end-to-end -end level. It's the solution is always there from the beginning. You just don't know what it is. And so the actual joy of the game is looking around and seeing what's up. And you're like, oh, this is clue number one to the final end game. Okay. Uh, oh, interesting. Oh, very interesting, you know? Clue number two. And then clue number three. Or they might be in the wrong order. And then you use all three to, you know, like, solve a bigger problem. So it's not, it's not like a linear experience. It's, it's really good. Um, but let's say, let's do a small example of the player looking out at a vista. And let's, let's call it, let's call this Zombie Generic Hunter 3. Okay? So you're your character. This is really widescreen. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring it in. There we go. Regular monitor size. So you're your character, you know, you've got your, your zombie shooting gun. Pew pew. Um, you got your, you got your cut off shorts. And you got your, your dad hair. There we go. Um, uh, and you're looking out at a new level, right? And so you're on like a hill. And what we want to do is direct this player through a forest to a safe spot. That's this particular setup here. We'll get to this design brief later. Um, and so let's say, um, let's use something useful. Let's make a little house. There's a little cabin 
right there. So the player, first of all, starts off looking directly at it. So as human beings, we tend to look where other people are looking. And, then it, and, like, and you, can, you can test it out for yourself, but it, it is true. Um, so, we, so he's looking right at it. it also, it's, let's make it less of a triangle just to suit this exact example. There we go. And it's, it's got like a, nice, it's a light, light on, and it's got maybe smoke coming out of it. So it's got a nice, useful shape, which is a square. It's light, whereas the background is dark. And it's got motion coming out of it, so it's immediately drawn the eye in several ways. And what we want to do is we want to let the player know without saying, Hey, go to that cabin. Um, and then an empty checkbox for your quest log. We want it to happen organically through level design. So the player is like, okay, they've established. This is the cabin I want to go to. All right. And let's put some stuff around the edges. Some very angry shapes. You know? Some angry shapes. So these are dangerous shapes. So some scraggly, angry um, trees, right? So now we've really kind of boxed in the player's view to this cabin. And then along the way there, we have some kind of like rolling hummocks or hills with round boulders. And you could even have, you could even have a little path there if you wanted to. There's nothing wrong with putting a path there. <laughs> and so, like just, you, can, you could squint at this picture and you would still be able to tell where, where it's going. Now there's a moon there too, because moons are pretty. And it's, it's another thing that'll drag the uh, character to look over here, or the player. There we go, there's moon. So now this player, you know, they're gonna go down here and they're gonna, you know, go towards the house. But let's say their path does not uh, hey, how you doing, Art Stuff? Um, Art Stuff is a game dev friend of mine. They do really cool work. Um, Art Stuff, I'm just I'm teaching a course here right now, so you're welcome to hang out. We're just talking about level design. And if you have any, you know, level design tips, because you make some pretty sweet levels for your games. It's been a while, it really has been. <laughs> um, but yeah. So let's say you're going down the hill, and you actually, the path to the so you can't see the the cabin anymore so you're going through here and there's a bunch of like tight windy uh you know areas over here and so you can't see the goal anymore but you want the player to know that they can still to still know where they're going essentially right so you're you're going through here and you've got you know your zombie shooter and you've got your zombies and they're walking around and this is where the choice kind of comes into it. So let's say you see there's a break in the trees over here, and maybe you can see some light coming from around the bend. So you know this is one way you can go. Or let's say there's some, you know, Tomb Raider style climbing things over here. So now there's two ways you can go. You can go to the obvious safe spot, which is light over here. Um, Try to make it a tutorial. Oh. Factorial. I don't know. I don't like that kind of game. I like I like uh, light games. It makes me happy. Um, factorial. Um, so the player now has two choices. They can either go through the zombies to the safe light area, or they could go up here and see what's here. And that that is a choice the player can make so these this is the shape with the affordances that they've already established you can make it even more clear with like ladders and stuff right maybe this is an old fire tower and they'll be able to like learn something up there maybe there'll be some loot they can use right so this is something useful this is something dangerous and this is something and these and these round shapes they are like kind of benign maybe safe is the wrong word but they're not a factor in the calculations, right? They're just they're just there. All right, so that is that. Ding. And the last one is testing, uh, because that is the most important step of making a level 
period. <laughs> like, like I said, like when I made that little crab game, um, I had my husband play it, and that was pretty much it. And um, then as soon as I started having other people play it, they did not understand what I thought was obvious. Like they didn't understand that you had to get to the top of the mountain. Like that was just something they didn't didn't think of. They're like, oh, well, how do I escape it? Well, maybe I'll go in through one of these caves and I'll escape that way. It's like, no, how about this cave? No, well, oh, well, I'm stumped. Like, they didn't, they didn't think to climb this because it was just, it was just out of the way. You know, they didn't. Like there was light coming through, but they didn't see an immediate path through here to here. And then once they started picking up objects, and then it said, bring this to the top of the spire. Even then, they were like, what spire? I don't see a spire because they were facing the wrong way by that point, right? So always, always, always test your levels. Always, always. Um, one kind of like AAA example of this was, I'm trying to remember which game it was. It might have been Dishonored that did it. And it was like there was some buildings and there was like a fence here that you weren't supposed to go through. But there was like, and there was windows, da, da, da. and there was an obvious way to go over here. At least it was obvious to the, the designers. But people kept going towards this fence, even though it was designed to um, uh, keep them out. Like this was, this is a no-go zone. You can't, you physically could not go over there. But people kept trying to jump and jump and jump and jump and use their powers. And they actually created um, a testing tool where every time somebody would jump in a test, it would put a little flag. And so they found out all the places that players were jumping in the game. And so they found these weird clusters right here. And like, well, that's weird. Why are they jumping there? Oh, they think they can go over there. This fence is not high enough. So what they did is they just put another building there. And they're like, this is completely a brick wall. You cannot go through here. And then people will stop jumping there because they didn't think they could go there. So that is that is testing and why it is so important. Da -da. Um, okay, so I'm going to be going for uh, 45 minutes now. So we're, we're, we're about on time. Uh, what I wanted to do right now is quickly design a level and then bring it into Unity and then we can play through it um, real quick. So uh, I'm using the kind of character that I made right at the beginning with like, you know, like a little fire girl, um, little cape, this one. <laughs> so she is a little scout and she needs to get through a cave so she must sneak through tunnels, avoiding flying enemies, to arrive at a safe area where the rest of her team is waiting. Along the way, a cave-in forces them to retreat quickly, making them backtrack. A jumping puzzle gets them around the cave-in. Okay? So, let's start off, for, for simplicity's sake, this is where we're starting off. And I'm going to start color coding because it's easier. Okay. So, let's say... The player starts off, and let's start drawing, kind of imagining what we're going to see at each, each step of the way. So this is step one. Um, so the player is going to start off, and let's say they're right in the middle. And you've got, you know, deep, dark taver caverns. And you can see right away, maybe this is a big open space, right? So you're kind of sheltered. Let's put the character off to the side a little bit. Maybe they actually start off hidden behind some rocks, some nice friendly round rocks. There's a big open area here. And in the distance, you can see the flying enemies and they're, they're bright red against the dark blue background. And maybe you even see them like attacking someone. And they're like, ah, and that person dies. And so you know immediately, like, those things are to be avoided. Okay, so now we've established that you must avoid the flying enemies. So that's good. So that's step one. Bring this up here. Okay, so that's, that's sort of panorama one. 
when I design levels for personal stuff, I often like to write it out as prose, like kind of just as, as though I was writing a book, like, and then uh, the player was sneaking through the dark caverns when they peeked around a rock um, because they heard noise on the other side. Carefully sneaking a peek, they saw one of their companions being attacked by fiery birds, right? Like, so then I would write that and then, oh, they had a decision to make. They could either go help them and go out into the open or they could remain, or there was another path that would take them around while being in cover. Let's move these guys all over. They could remain in cover and not help their friend. And so we can have like a different color in here. So maybe this area over here is like orange for danger. And there could even be lava on the other side. So you can see this is a nice open art area. And so now you can, you know, player can either go here or they could go here and engage with the enemies, right? So now they actually have choice. And it's been made explicit through the use of like shape language, shape, like friendly, cool rocks. This is this area over here is in darkness. Whereas this area is in light. This area is exposed and this area is hidden. So it's reinforcing itself. And and they and they're gonna know that they want to go down here because it's it's the only obvious exit. And you could even make it obvious by making it square. There you go. Yeah, look at look at doors in video games. They're they're square. There. So that's that is the um, the way. And also what you can think about is how to draw the eye to that area. So we have kind of like curves going towards it and all that stuff. Okay, so that's number 1. So let's do number 2. And I'll bring it up there again, but I like to draw it big. So the next part is uh, they need to know to arrive at a safe area where their team is waiting, but they experience a cave-in. So they get through there, and maybe they're going through, you know, dark tunnels. And there's, you know, a couple of branching paths ahead. And that's too big. So they're going through dark tunnels. This area is kind of like blocked off by rocks. And then ahead they see two tunnels. And they both go off into the distance. And, you know, there's some rocks between them. And let's say they actually, you know, see one of them is kind of like, kind of orange, implying there might be some some danger here and the other one is nice and cool and they can actually maybe see um, like shapes of some of their you know companions down here maybe one of them waves to them and they're like hey come over here so now the player is very it's very clear that this is where they're supposed to go so they've got you know rocks around the edges so the player can see easily where where they're supposed to be to do and so they're gonna go probably over to this one right they've made the choice themselves but it's what we wanted them to do right if they had gone to the left that's still perfectly reasonable there's nothing wrong with that right do, do, do. there we go and then step three so the cave-in So, cave in now. Now your character is partly made of fire, they produce light. So light means others are there. Okay, that and that's fair. And that's fair. So maybe there's a bit of a trade-off. Because they are they are kind of made of fire. Let me pull up their design again. I'm trying to remember them. Because um, they did have fire on their head. You're totally right. But it was kind of like a subdued purpley fire, if I recall. Let me find them. There. So yeah, so they're, they're actually a pretty... Like dark character design overall and maybe but you're right no you're totally right let me get a nice there we go so an important thing we could do then is we would have a very specific color for them and a very specific color for the bad guys 
any kind of fire makes light. This is true. <laughs> um, uh, let me find where's my entire yeah. So here's what this was the this was the uh, character sheet. So we had you know, and we could say this color maybe pink is the color of fire they produce, whereas orange with uh, that was a very ugly yellow orange yellow red this is the danger fire this is like chill fire this is friendly fire anything that's like a blue fire that creates light is friendly and everything that is um yellow is uh, unfriendly and it works because if you do colorblind you can still tell the difference <laughs> my boss is colorblind so i've gotten really used to using the the photoshop control y to uh, assess if he'll be actually able to see the difference in what I'm doing and if it'll actually look good to him. So, yeah. Um, so now we know, like, this is this is friendly fire and this is unfriendly fire. So that's, that was a very good point, thank you. So friendly fire, friendly fire, friendly fire, friendly fire, friendly fire. So, and you can even, you can even make it even more purple to make a, a bigger difference. But yeah, so now we have established actually a shape, a uh, color language, um, where we have, you know, danger, danger, and safety. And if you recall the color wheel, uh, the opposite of orange is indigo. So now we actually have diametrically opposed colors signaling our safety and our danger zones, which is perfect. Um, uh, can the levels be in a closed space since the examples are all open spaces? Um, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll show you how I'm making it. It doesn't have to be. Like, we're, we're going to be making super basic versions of this. We're just going to be making taste, like, test stuff. So, so don't, don't worry about it. <laughs> um, yeah, don't, don't worry about that. We'll, we'll, we'll make it work. Okay, so step three, so you're going down, and it could be like a really long and spooky tunnel, you know, like really, you're going through it, and then suddenly, you know, like something goes boom, and then you see the, the rocks running to, coming towards you, and like maybe a dust cloud comes up, and so you're gonna start running back, right? So there we go. And so maybe it blocks off. Maybe it blocks off right here. And you never were in any danger, but you're still going to be unable to progress. And so you can just see, like, this room is now dark. This is a dark blue room. There's no way through. It is closed. There is nothing to be done here. There we go. I might as well save it. That's fair. Uh, okay. And then finally, doo -doo -doo, uh, the player comes to another room. So they, they're forced to go back this way now, right? So they have to go into the other one that they had not wanted to go into before. And they could have gone there the first time. Like, there's no reason why not to. And so now the player needs to kind of like face their fears, right? And so now, once again, we have a big open area and open areas always cause anxiety in games with enemies because that's, that's where they can see you. That's where they can get you, right? So you, you're in your own little area, you know, it's closed off. They can't see you. And then you see a clear path Let's make it more square. Let's say it's it's an old bridge that has been put down like by, by your ancestors or something and it's, it's going across and parts of it have fallen into the lava. So this is all lava now. And you can see on the far side is another, oh, let's put it over here just because that's good composition. So now there's the far side of the room, 
and then we have maybe some rock spires over here to show that it's dangerous. Right? And then what's worse is you can see that there's birds kind of like sitting on the rock spires. So you know that once you get started, they're gonna come get you, right? <laughs> yeah, that's why Minecraft scares me so much because it's so open lol. You actually get the art opposite impression, art stuff, really? That you, you find that open spaces make you more comfortable? Huh. But I think it also depends on how you frame the game. A small space also means you have nowhere to run to, so an open space means you have lots of space to maneuver. And that's true, that's very true. But like, let's say, um, and one game that did this very, very well was Hyper Light Drifter. So Hyper Light Drifter, uh, let me pull up some screens. It actually had a really good um, variation of like small areas and open areas. Um, this one kind of shows it actually. So I'll bring this in. So uh, in this game, this is you over here. And in these big rooms, you've been trained. So you enter the room and you're in a small area. And then you exit the room and you're in a small closed off area. And whenever you're, like the enemies will not notice you while you're in here. The big thing is contrast. That's, and that's exactly it, exactly. So if you are in a small area and there are enemies, you feel safe because they can't see you. If you're in the if you're in the middle of a, a meadow, in Breath of the Wild, and there's like a a, a a stream, and it's nice, and there's little ducks in the stream, like yes, that's uh, that is not gonna make you anxious. But if there are enemies, ah, <laughs> if there are enemies that can see you when you're in the open, it will it will cause anxiety, and it will be a a decision to leave safety if you go out. And so whenever you leave safety in this game, you will immediately get spotted and then the fight will begin, right? So that's, uh, that's the, uh, the silver Lionel charges you. That's a good point, <laughs> exactly. Um, he sees you, you've, you've come out from behind the rocks. And so let's bring back our you know, color theory here. Da, da, da. So we can see you know, safe colors, like colors to us. And so we're gonna have to make it across this path to get to the end. Perfect, okay. And then you get there and you meet up with your team. So that is done, okay. So now all we have to do is draw it out, essentially, PTSD flashbacks. Oh yeah, that's what I meant, like fighting the enemies when they spot me, yeah. So, so now we have an idea of the basic, we have the brief, we have kind of an idea of what the character will be dealing with at each step along the way. It's been clarified. And so now we can start with actually building the levels. So let's let's create some spaces. Maybe there's a little hole you came from over here. You can't get back in. And it's a nice round open space. You're actually much smaller than this. Right? I think I'm just a coward. <laughs> I don't think so. I think that there's a lot of reasons why um, someone would want to uh, stay hidden when there's danger around. It's human nature. So we see that there is the exit. I'll put it a little bit further so you can clearly see it. Um, there is the open area over here with the lava around the edge. This is lava. This is a rock. This is a rock. And then there's rocks all the way along here. So, and we'll block this properly in Unity. This is just like an idea, right? So we have, you know, lava. Da, 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 da. And this is where, you know, you want the character either to go here or here. Either way, they want to go through here. And then the next one, they'll go on for a little while. I can flip this whole thingy so that I'll actually be able to fit it. There we go. And this is the far tunnel. 
And this is the um, uh, left tunnel that goes to danger. And this one is actually, it might as well just be empty, right? Because it's just going to have rocks here. And then, um, do, do, do. this one has, you know, it's, a, it's got a little, another open area. And it's got a little, you know, craggly opening. And it's got, you know, there. And then this is the, this is the win condition right here. And it's got some spikes. And once again, lava. And maybe we make it a little bit more interesting by giving people, you know, a false way to go. You know, they're, they come out here and then they can either jump to, so they come here and they, we want them to go down here, but then they go back and then they go here and then we can have them go boom, boom, boom. And then maybe this actually is the correct way because it's, you know, got, it's, you can finish the leap, but because there's birds over here, these guys are over here, they're not gonna wanna go that way. They're gonna try and go this way first. And they're gonna, oh, you know, I can't do it that way. I'm gonna have to go around after all. So and there we go, that is our little level. And I'm just going silver metal hunting every garden, guardian killing spree. The yeah, first time I ever played, I was like, I'm going straight for the castle. And I got launched. So that was exciting. <laughs> <laughs> so this is this is our design that we've come up with okay so let us now go into blender and using our new modeling skills do, 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 do. come on please work why aren't you working oh it didn't work at all. How about that? There we go. Okay. <laughs> nice. Um, I'm not going to see this yet, so let's get rid of everything in the scene and let's start again. So let us uh, take this. I'm just going to take everything, make a new image using that, and I'm going to crop it so that I have just what I want. So I have this. And I have this, perfect. And I'm gonna save this as um, lava level plan. And then I realized you couldn't see what I was doing. <laughs> Are you making a whole game on stream today? Uh, no, no, this is just, um, I like to work with example stuff, yeah. <laughs> uh, so I'm gonna go and I'm gonna bring in I want to add, there it is, add a reference. Yeah. I was going to say, you're crazy. No, no, no. This is just, this is just like uh, level design. Uh, all of the, all of the uh, students have already been working on cool characters. And uh, this is just like, uh, this is class six out of eight. Level design plan. There we go. Okay. So let's get this lying down. I need it to relax. Why will it not relax? No, relax. There we go. Okay. Okay, so this is the level. Yeah. And we can go in and we can make it um, say on Pokemon. Yeah, yeah. I've been doing this course on, uh, on Tuesdays. And um, I'm also doing one that's more industry level on Thursdays, but that one is definitely way below your level stuff. So <laughs> don't worry. Yeah, for those who don't know, Art Stuff is an extremely accomplished character modeler. Um, you're working on that one game, is it Gods and Monsters right now? Was that the one you're on? Um, if so, I hope that's going well. And so I'm just going to go and I'm going to make a circle. Not anymore, no? You had enough of them. And I'm just going to merge the center. 
And then I'm going to take these bad boys. Got another gig. Got another company. Nice, nice, nice. Yeah. Living the industry life. Yeah. I hope uh, coronavirus hasn't hit you too hard, man. It's been a little bit tough for people here in the city. There we go. And I'm just extruding areas for people to walk on real quick. And actually, you know what? I'm going to get rid of those. And I'm just going to copy and delete those. And I'm just going to grab these. Toy paper. So these are looking up. Yeah. Yeah, I found some the other day. I was like, yes. Sweet, sweet elixir. And for this one, um, I don't want to save actually. No. I'm going to cut it out so that. There we go. And all this is actually going to be lower. And you don't have to make this pretty, because this is just, um, that's interesting. Yeah. There we go, and get rid of those. Oh, too much, too many things selected. Actually, you know what, I'll keep it like that, that's fine. And then, let's grab this stuff. Yeah. And let's put it over here on the other side. Perfect. Okay, cool. And so that is pretty much good to go. And let us make sure it is all... Um, we're going to find out shortly if the uh, normals are actually working well. So let's grab this and export it as an FBX. And put it right here. I might as well just bring everything in here. And let's call this uh, fire level. And let's bring it into Unity. So let's hide the Jasmine level. And this is uh, stuff. This is a pre made game. So <laughs> um, let's bring in fire level from. Oh, let me make sure you guys can see what I'm actually doing. Haha. -ha. There we go. Wisdom here. Wisdom. And we're almost done. Don't worry, everybody. <laughs> we're getting there. Um, I want just the chorus, and I want fire level. Nice. I made a template for you students? Yeah. All right. So this is clearly backwards. <laughs> um, I'm going to go into Blender. You'll be able to see this, but I am, in fact, doing it. And I'm just going to go to Mesh, Normals, Flip. And I'm going to re-export it again and export it into my uh, game directly so that I don't have to go back and re-drag it in. So fire level that FBX inside the meshes. There we go. Perfect. Okay. And that'll just do for now. Okay. Let's rotate it. And let's make it bigger. And let's give it a mesh component, a mesh collider, so that you don't actually fall into it. Let's call it static. Let's see. All right, let's see if this works. OK. <laughs> it's 50-50. Of course, yeah, I put it up, I put it up on um, uh, itch. There we go, yeah. So now we have, in fact, a little uh, level that you can run around in. So this is the, this is the bare bones of the level. Um, obviously it's not enclosed. <laughs> and obviously it's not, um, you know, 
flushed out. There's no cave in. It doesn't work. Um, there's no can't. It's kind of hard to see what's lava and what's not. And let's say I wanted to make part of it lava. I would just go into Blender and I would set a material to be um, a certain part of it. And I would need to test it so that I'd be like, okay, so this is how much um, distance I need for each of these jumps. I could go in and um, let's say I wanted to put some cubes in here. Let's put some cubes. To do. So these are now the cubes for you to hide behind. Um, Control D is to duplicate them. You can rotate them. Make them small. And let's start the character out closer this way. Where they can still kind of see what's going on. But they're not like part of it yet, right? Now I make this very tall. There we go. So now we can kind of see how this is taking shape. So we would have basically a view, and I'm going to start the camera in a different position actually. Mm -hmm. Let me, where's my camera? Character cam. Let's start it a little bit. I can't move it in there directly. I have to do it in here, do I? Um, X axis value. So I wanted to start off kind of like that. And so now when the game starts, you know, I can see like, oh, I, I, I can't go in here. I could go and you know, help this guy or I could go around and then, you know, go from there. And so then I would, next step would be to add blocks in the lava, yada, 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 get, you guys get the idea. So that's kind of, that's kind of what I wanted to discuss today is just the principles of designing a level. Let's see. You may need to make the level a bit larger, like 50%. Yeah, I completely agree. Um, and what you can do to make sure that your blocks move with the level is you just parent them under the level like that. So I just grabbed all my blocks with shift select and then fire level and then boom, right? And let's bring it. Yeah, that, yeah, you're totally right. That is better. Okay. Nice. But yeah, so you guys get the idea, and so you can kind of move around, put blocks in here, and you can like assign materials to stuff, so you could be like, this is, you know, red, or this mm -hmm. is black, or whatever you want, right? I think I have a couple of pre-made, there's a ton of pre-made uh, materials in here from previous students, so you can just use pre-made colors, it doesn't really matter what you use, um, you have a ton of stuff. So yeah, um, I'll be here until 8 o'clock. Uh, feel free to just have fun. Mm -hmm. I'm going to post this uh, this project file in um, in the Discord, or at least I'll link to it. At least I'll link to a Dropbox of it because it'll be huge. Um, mm -hmm. But in the meantime, just kind of like think of a story for your character. So, like for example, um, let's say your character is. Uh, Apollo the sea salamander dragon thing, right? So maybe your level is kind of in the sky, right? So you, maybe you'll have like a bunch of like clouds over an open sort of abyss and you'll need to, you know, get to like here and here and you'll need to collect maybe some plants or something along the way. Just think of a story and then maybe come up with uh, two or three still frames of, uh, let's see, Where's my um, Photoshop? Photoshop? No? Photoshop? There you are. But yeah, just kind of come up with um, a couple of still frames. There we go. Of like what you would expect to see and just kind of like reason it out to yourself before you start. It's like, you guys saw, it took me about half an hour to kind of think my way through this. And how long did it take to actually design the level? Maybe two minutes? 
because I already knew what I was making before I started drawing shapes on the ground, right? So that is, that's kind of the idea you want to go for is, is, uh, is like that. And yeah, I'll be around till eight for any questions you have. And if you're still working on, um, here, I'll bring my face back up so you guys can feel properly addressed. Hi. <laughs> um, yeah, so if you have any more modeling questions, any rigging questions, any animation questions, let me know. And I will um, uh, put this all up shortly. And I hope it all goes well for you guys. I hope everybody's staying safe and chilling out at home and playing some sweet video games. Uh, so yeah, that's it for me today. And I wish you all a good night. See you.